So good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for being here with us this afternoon. I'm Professor Alison from the Federal University of Paraná. And we are gathered online this afternoon to have the second session of our online event, Applied Linguistics Q&A Sessions. Uh, this is an online event organized by Professor Posani Silveira and myself with the support of the graduate program in English from the Federal University of Santa Catarina and Núcleo de Assessoria Pedagógica and the Department of Modern Thought Foreign Languages at the Federal University of Paraná. Uh, today, we have Professor Eduardo Diniz Figueiredo and Professor Sago Siqueira, who will address the issue of English as a lingua franca. Prior to the session, our two guest lecturers were asked to prepare a presentation to discuss how English as a lingua franca can be taught locally. I kindly ask you to submit your questions and comments on Zoom or through the chat on YouTube. É, perguntas também podem ser enviadas em português, se você se sente mais confortável. We will address these questions later on during the session. Before we start, I'd like to thank all the audience for the participation. Also, uh, the lecturers who will be taking part of the upcoming sessions of this event. And of course, Eduardo and Sávio, who are here with us this afternoon. I also would like to thank Professor Rosani for the partnership in this event, and Harissa, who has been our go-to for when we need help. I will now move on to the introductions of our two guest lecturers. Uh, Professor Eduardo Diniz holds a PhD in Applied Linguistics from the Arizona State University. He is a professor at the Department of Modern Foreign Languages at the Federal University of Paraná, and a professor at the Letras Graduate Program at the same institution. His research agenda encompasses issues such as English as a lingua franca, English as an international language, academic writing, and critical applied linguistics. Professor Savio Siqueira holds a PhD in Applied Linguistics from the Federal University of Bahia. He is a professor at the Letras Institute at the same university and a professor at the Graduate Program of Language and Culture at the Federal University of Bahia as well. His line of work investigates issues related to teacher education, critical pedagogies, and critical approaches to English as a lingua franca or an international language, among others. So thank you very much for being here with us this afternoon. Uh, and now let's dive right into the session. Thank you. Okay. Okay. So do you want to begin, Savio? Well, <laughs> so yeah, I'll, 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 I'll say uh, hello for the, and then, and then you move on. Well, thank you very right. much uh, uh, for, for this great, kind invitation. So I'm very glad to be here with you. Uh, thank you, Professor Allison and Professor Rosani. It's a pleasure to participate in this event. And it's also a pleasure to be with my colleague and friend Eduardo from, from Paraná. Uh, and uh, with the, this audience that I hope we have fun together to discuss a topic that despite the fact that it's been here for some time already, but then uh, it's always interesting to be interacting and uh, exchanging ideas with, uh, you know, practitioners, colleagues, and people interested uh, in the topic. So then uh, I'll pass on to Eduardo because we decided not to have individual uh, presentations. So we are we put together one single presentation and it will be overlapping in, in sometimes and then, uh, you know, dividing the, 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 the presentation into different parts where uh, one of us will be leading. 
So, but anyway, thank you very much for, for the invitation, the, the organizers, and, and uh, thank you very much for the audience to be here with us. Eduardo. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, I want to start by saying thank you as well. Uh, I uh, thank you, first of all, to uh, Professor Alison Gonçalves and to Professor Rosane Silveira, uh, who are people who I admire. And, you know, I have, uh, I'm, I'm honored to have been invited, uh, to have received this kind invitation, as Savio said, uh, to this event uh, uh, for a number of reasons, not only because of the invitation itself, but because, you know, it involves institutions that are dear to my heart, you know, UFPR, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, which uh, is being very well represented by Alison, right? Ufski and PPJ Ufski, you know, where I was a student, uh, I'm an alumni there, right? Uh, alumnum, sorry, there, right? And uh, also to see that there are many friends and colleagues uh, watching us, and I'm very happy to be sharing this presentation to be uh, presenting alongside. Savio Siqueira, who is a colleague and a friend, like he said, and uh, whose work I admire so much. So uh, uh, I'm very happy to be here, and uh, we're very happy that uh, uh, we hope that uh, what we have for you today is something that's going to be uh, interesting and helpful uh, uh, for you know your teaching, your research, and for us to build uh, connections and networks together. Um, so let's start. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, um, I'm going to share the presentation that we have for you. Um, I hope everybody can see that. Uh, basically, uh, the title is English as a lingua franca, right? Because that's the title of the presentation that was uh, sent to us, right? Uh, and uh, like Savio, uh, like Alison said, we were sent a question uh, uh, ahead of the presentation, right? But before we start getting to the presentation itself, I just want to acknowledge all the institutions that are involved, right? Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't get the new logo for delaying for this here, but it's important to acknowledge all the institutions involved and all the work that, you know, uh, uh, public universities are doing all across Brazil uh, to get together a, a number of people and construct events like this, right? So. Uh, it's very important to do that. Also, before moving on, uh, uh, I talked to Alison last week, and because we uh, we don't know very much about the audience and who the audience is, uh, we thought that it would be a good idea uh, for us to give a brief introduction in Portuguese, uh, so that you know maybe somebody who's still learning English and who would like to uh, uh, see this presentation at some point, you know, it might help guide this person. Uh, uh, as they see the rest of the presentation in English. So I'm gonna just say a few words in Portuguese about what we're gonna do, and then uh, we will move on to English, right? Então, basicamente, só para explicar um pouquinho do que a gente vai fazer, foi enviada uma pergunta para a gente. Essa pergunta foi, como ensinar inglês como língua franca localmente? E a gente vai começar apresentando essa pergunta. Para discutir essa pergunta, a gente vai discutir primeiro o que a gente entende como inglês como língua franca. E para fazer, para fazer isso, a gente vai uh, quebrar esse conceito, ou, ou dividir esse conceito em três partes. Discutir primeiro a concepção de língua, uh, as concepções de língua que informam a gente nessa, 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 uh, uh, na, no, no que a gente entende como inglês como língua franca, o conceito de língua franca e a importância do inglês, ou por que se fala tanto no inglês como língua franca uh, uh, nesse cenário. Né? Uh, depois a gente vai falar um pouquinho sobre sobre a, a, a área de inglês como língua franca, olhando tanto que, fazendo uma divisão entre o fato de que existe o fenômeno em si, de que existe a área de estudo e como essa área de estudo se relaciona com outras áreas de estudo e também como essa área de estudo tem sido desenvolvida localmente aqui no Brasil, né, em, uh, por diferentes pesquisadores e pesquisadoras. É, a gente, depois disso, a gente vai uh, passar a discutir a questão em si, né, de como ensinar inglês como língua franca localmente, e a gente vai começar uh, problematizando a pergunta, na verdade, né, a gente vai começar perguntando, é possível ensinar inglês como língua franca? É a primeira coisa que a gente vai fazer, e depois disso a gente vai perguntar, ok, e se sim ou não, eu não vou dizer agora para não estragar a surpresa que a gente tem, mas se sim ou não, é esse, uh, uh, o que, como fazer isso localmente, ou o que é que esse local tem a ver com isso. Então, a gente vai discutir algumas questões com relação a esse local. 
E a gente vai trazer tanto algumas questões que a gente acha que são mais meta, meta educacionais, meta linguísticas, meta cognitivas, não sei que meta, para ser sincero, mas meta com relação a, a esse ensino de, de, a, a, de inglês como língua franca, seja ele possível ou não, eu não vou dizer ainda né, o que, é que a gente discutiu, mas a gente vai falar sobre as questões um pouco meta primeiro e depois a gente vai trazer alguns exemplos uh, locais, tanto das práticas do Sávio, uh, quanto das práticas que eu tenho uh, experimentado também. Então, a, vai ser mais ou menos isso. A gente espera que isso, isso dê uma hora, né? <risos> a gente está com medo de dar um pouquinho mais, e se der um pouquinho mais, a gente espera que a gente possa continuar com vocês e vamos receber perguntas também em português, tá bom? Agora a gente vai switch back to English, porque é como a gente foi combinou com, com o Alisson e com a Rosane, tá bom? Vamos lá, então. So, um, as we said, uh, we received this question from uh, Rosani and from Alison. How can we teach English as a lingua franca locally, right? And uh, as I said in Portuguese, we decided that uh, uh, first we, we, we thought it was important for us to discuss the concept itself of English as a lingua franca, right? And we decided to break down this concept uh, into three Uh, uh, parts, right? Uh, the first part or the first element is uh, a lingua, right? The lingua in English as a lingua franca, right? And this has to do with our understandings of language, right? The second one is lingua franca, right? So uh, based on this understanding of language, what does lingua franca mean, right? Uh, uh, and this idea of being with the other uh, with this lingua franca, right? And then we decided to discuss why Uh, there has been so much attention to English and this idea of English as a lingua franca and emphasize the fact that uh, it's English as a lingua franca and not as the lingua franca as some people sometimes like to uh, uh, say, you know, or, or at least I've seen in, uh, some people discuss English as the lingua franca and we want to be, uh, we want to make sure that we're not uh, uh, using that, right? And we want to explain that. So to break down the concept a little bit, uh, we will start uh, uh, addressing the concept of language as we, uh, 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 Savio and I, you know, uh, at least we share some of this. I mean, it doesn't mean that we're both have the exact same concept of language. I don't think anybody does, right? But this is uh, uh, the concept that, the concepts that inform us in, uh, in terms of what language is, right? So we do see language as a social practice, right? And by that, we mean that We understand language as it happens, you know, in practice among and between individuals and uh, people uh, in different contexts uh, all over the world, right? Uh, we do see language also as an open system, uh, which means that although we acknowledge the systematicity of language, we don't think that it is a predefined system that, you know, uh, I, that people communicate through Uh, using something that is pre-established, but you know that people construct uh, uh, new things with language, people use language in different ways, they adapt this system to their own realities, they adapt uh, uh, their own realities to this system as well, so the system is open in many different ways, right? Mm -hmm. We do see language as semiotic resources, so this is broader than seeing language just as, a, as verbal language. We do see that language uh, uh, exists in, uh, in practice, And this practice, you know, involves not only uh, 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 verbal language, but it involves, uh, and not only what we see as separate languages, but in communication, you know, we mesh languages and we uh, use other modes of communication. You know, we use colors, we use uh, uh, other sounds, we use images, we use uh, uh, smells and, and many different things that uh, uh, help us communicate what we want to communicate. And uh, finally, uh, it's important for us to emphasize that, you know, through languages, we construct identities and we do things in the world. So language is not just a way of saying things, but it's a way of doing things and it's a way of being a certain type of person in the world. And that's a very uh, a Bakhtinian concept, uh, uh, but we also borrow from other authors in saying that like uh, Jim G and others in, in uh, uh, In discourse studies, right? Uh, now, moving on. Uh, so what do we mean by lingua franca? Uh, first, why is, that in, why is that concept of language that I just explained important? 
because we think that, you know, there's, there's different people discussing English as a lingua franca and lingua franca in general, but we, we think that it only makes sense, uh, uh, and I think I speak for both Savio and myself, it only makes sense for us to think about lingua franca when we think about uh, uh, this uh, uh, interaction between people and, you know, language being used as a social practice, right? The concept of, Engli uh, of lingua franca uh, uh, without the English yet, right? Uh, has to do with when two or more people who come from different lingua cultural backgrounds communicate through linguistic resources that they share. Now, I know that this share might seem problematic to some people because they don't share the exact same thing, right? Each one brings their own repertoire to these uh, uh, linguistic uh, uh, events, to, to communication, but at least they, we can say that they share something or that they semi-share some elements in, in this communication. Now, this sounds fancy, perhaps, on the slide. So uh, I saw a live that uh, uh, Savio participated with some professors from Tocantins, professors and students, and with Professor uh, Haja Gopal. And I saw that last Sunday. And I like very much the way that Haja said, it's it, when two people from different lingua cultural backgrounds don't jeito, right? Don't jeito de se comunicar they, they e se comunicar. Do. Yeah, the, exactly, <laughs> exactly. They make do, right? They do something and they get through and the, uh, uh, they, you know, uh, communicate, right? They put communication first, right? So it's, uh, uh, I think, a more direct way of saying this, right? And it involves the negotiation and co-construction of linguistic, cultural, and semiotic meanings and repertoires. Uh, so that means each one of us in lingua franca situations, we bring our linguistic repertoires, we bring our histories, we bring our cultures, we bring other semiotic meanings that, you know, can uh, take place within the, con the immediate context where we are, but also in, in, uh, from other uh, uh, tr parts of our trajectory. So all of this is part negotiating this and co-constructing this in each communicative event has to do with what we understand as lingua franca. Now, to put it simply, uh, uh, a lot of times when we talk about uh, lingua franca, we think about, you know, somebody, I'm going to give a very uh, uh, simple example, and uh, forgive me if it's too simple, but, you know, you have somebody from uh, Japan, somebody from Italy who supposedly speak, you know, because they could speak many first languages, but who supposedly speak a different first language, right? Uh, they are speaking German to each other. German is being the lingua franca that is being used at that moment by those two people, right? So any language really, uh, uh, any named language or unnamed language, right, if you will, can be a, a lingua franca, right? But if any language can be a lingua franca, why, why so much focus on English, right? Why is English, you know, why all this, the, the spotlight on English, right? Uh, there are a few different reasons that people have discussed on why this uh, uh, spotlight on English, right? One is that the global spread of this language is of unprecedented magnitude, right? We have languages that have spread globally, that have spread internationally in many different times in history, you know, uh, but uh, not with the same magnitude, not with the same uh, 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 force as English has had within the past uh, uh, century or centuries maybe, right? Uh, uh, and of course, this has to do with a number of reasons, and we're not going to get into that here, but it has to do with a number of reasons related to power, you know, to uh, uh, economic power and political power and bellic power, you know, military power, right, of uh, specific nations, particularly, you know, the UK and the USA, right? Uh, which also means that we have to look at this critically as well, right, as we will say throughout this presentation, right? Now, what's interesting uh, from an applied linguistics uh, uh, standpoint, uh, uh, or at least one of the things that's in interesting from an applied linguistics standpoint, is that the spread of English has challenged or further challenged some notions about language itself and about language teaching. For example, one thing that we see with English as, uh, uh, with the use of English today or with uh, people communicating in English today uh, is that you know, there are more non-native speakers of English than native speakers of English. Just one example, right? So what does that say about this idealization, you know, idealizing a native speaker of English as a, a model for teaching? Does that make sense? You know, so that's a question that we can 
problematize, right? That we can ask ourselves, does it make sense to idealize a native speaker? And when we think about language ownership, does that mean that everybody has ownership over the language or is the ownership still solely in the hands of, you know, the queen and Harry Potter and Obama and, you know, I don't, you know, uh, um, and also, you know, we deconstruct this uh, natural association between languages, cultures, and territories. We problematize that, right? Uh, uh, because, uh, uh, you know, we see that languages are much more fluid and, you know, pertain to different cultures and different territories. So this natural association between languages, cultures, and territories becomes further complexified and, and, and problematized, right? Now, of course, there is a lot of criticism on uh, this idea of English uh, being used internationally, right? Uh, uh, one of them is that, you know, this international status of English is rather a discourse than actual practice. Some people will say that, right? Uh, uh, and what do they mean by that? They mean that there is generally uh, 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 an idea that English is neutral, that it's natural, and that is apolitical, that is beneficial necessarily, right? And that it's used by everyone. And that has been critiqued, right? That has been criticized by different scholars, right? And one of the criticisms is, you know, there's little access by some populations, right? And English is not necessarily beneficial. English is not necessarily, and we have to look at English, even though we do see its potential and its affordance as a language of communication or, you know, that people are using, there are, uh, uh, we have to look at this uh, uh, critically and we have to be very much aware of, uh, uh, of the issues involved critically in that. Before we move on, I just wanna say, you probably noticed that we don't have any, uh, any um, uh, citations in the slides. We decided to do that to leave the slides clean a little bit. I should have said <laughs> that in the beginning, but uh, we will have citations for you at the end, right? We will have some references for you at the end. So I'll, I'll move on to Savio now. Savio, it's your okay. turn. I'll just, I'll just uh, uh, change the slides from now on. <laughs> all right, all right. So then thank you, Eduardo. So uh, as, as uh, you, you, you brilliantly mentioned, so this introduction to the, the concept of English as a lingua franca uh, is very important because uh, what happens, so this is a, a very contradictory concept in the sense that uh, because of the, the term lingua franca, so the traditional term, uh, the traditional concept of lingua franca, so it's been hard sometimes, uh, you know, to discuss or to reconstruct the, the, the concept of lingua franca under different or, let's say, uh, more uh, contemporary terms. So then uh, that's why sometimes there is a lot of resistance uh, even from colleagues, this, because they say, well, lingua franca is basically lingua franca, and what you are discussing here is nothing but a, a let's say, uh, something that uh, may, may lead it, people and even practitioners into, into some misunderstandings. But it's important from what you said that uh, since the 1990s, more or less the 1990s, so studies, you know, uh, on English as a lingua franca that basically were done before under the label of English as an international language. I remember when I began working on my thesis, so I didn't find anything really, uh, let's say, more systematized on English as a lingua franca. So all my bibliography, basically uh, everything that I got, it was basically on world Englishes and English as an international language. Uh, but, uh, you know, very rarely do we, did we talk about ELF. But then within the studies, and uh, as we can see, as the phenomenon began to grow and call attention, when, when Eduardo mentioned, why English? So, well, any language can, can function as a lingua franca, but English calls the attention for different reasons, uh, as was mentioned, uh, especially the military, and also because of imperialism, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. So, but English is a phenomenon. English as a global language is a very a different phenomenon in the sense because of its magnitude. And then we begin to study, uh, you know, English as a lingua franca from, you know, let's say a more solid perspective. So then as we can see here in the slides, we have, uh, you know, this the global spread of English 
calls attention and it's a very important phenomenon. And it can be, of course, in, in tap, interpreted in different, uh, you know, let's say perspectives. So we have different fields, as I mentioned already, world Englishes. Haja Gopalan, our dear friend, uh, prefers to use uh, world English with a different, you know, uh, perspective in, in the sense that, uh, you know, is, it is this language that belongs to nobody and has no native speakers. He's even more radical in this sense. So, and uh, of course, because of widespread communication practices, interactions taking place in, in English as, uh, as an internet, at, at an international level, especially because of technology and uh, uh, the internet. So uh, even though I was reading that uh, a lot of different languages are advancing on, 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 on let's say, on, on, on the cyberspace. So English, uh, I was reading a research from uh, to 2014 uh, on Facebook. Portuguese, for example, was one of the languages together with Arabic. So there were two languages that were most used, even more, of course, in different proportion than English. And English is coming to a stable, uh, it's becoming stable uh, in, in the cyberspace. So then, of course, English is still dominant, but the gap between English and the other languages is, is getting, you know, smaller. So then out of this whole, uh, you know, investigation, we, we have, you know, since, as I said, the early 20s, we have an area of study that we call English as a lingua franca. So we have the phenomenon, we have uh, an area of study. And uh, Jennifer Jenkins, who's uh, maybe one of the pioneers, uh, we usually call her one of the mothers of the field. So recently in 2015, she elaborated this, this reflection and divided so far the area of study into three air in three phases. So that she called ELF1, ELF2, and ELF3. So ELF1, um, it was a time when we basically concentrated on forms, uh, empirical data through corpora, especially like voice and uh, in, in else in other other corpora where we could identify traces of English as a lingua franca. So, and uh, of course, the famous lingua franca core that is still very popular, and especially uh, for those scholars who, who uh, analyze the teaching of pronunciation, taking the lingua franca core as a basis. So, but this was the time when the idea uh, was to see ELF as a variant, as one a variation. And we, as the studies began to, to continue and to grow, we got into a second phase that was, attention was more to processes, was when pragmatics came in, right? And then uh, in a way, uh, we started to look at different processes involved in ELF practices, especially pragmatic uh, strategies, including accommodations, uh, the strategies people use to communicate, and then, uh, for example, the, 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 the resources uh, speakers use to communicate, including the semiotic resources um, Eduardo has mentioned already. And then for her, we have entered, or we are to enter, we, 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 I don't think we have really yet this ELF3 within ELF within a frame of multilingualism. So, and she even coined English as a multilingua franca, where uh, English would uh, function among different languages because, you know, as we know, the world is much more multilingual than monolingual or even bilingual. So monolingual, let's say, populations are basically an exception, even though you know, for example, in, in parts of our country, we have, uh, let's say, monolingual, monolingual in quotes, of course, uh, populations. And then it's something that we bring into the, you know, into our practices. And I think ELF studies come together with what Eduardo mentioned in terms of English, of, of the native speaker. I think we also try to deconstruct this whole idea of monolingualism as, you know, the general uh, 
uh, picture. On the contrary, multilingualism. So the world is much more multilingual than monolingual. And then, of course, we dialogue with different areas, the related areas that are always in dialogue. So then for, for some authors, so they, uh, they would, would, in a way, reject this whole idea of English as a lingua franca. But on the contrary, we that, you know, work with English or under a perspective of English as a lingua franca, we see points of contact and very important points of contact with uh, world Englishes, World English coined by, by Hajan, critical sociolinguistics, pragmatics, and of course, English language teaching, because we cannot, uh, I, I don't believe that, uh, you know, whatever comes from research, you know, cannot be basically static, you know, for, for us scholars to be discussing among us. So English language teaching to me is the, 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 the most important arena where we can apply, we can, uh, you know, shed light on uh, with the, the, what comes from our studies, right? And of course, uh, you know, English as a lingua franca, when it began the studies, so it was something from the North, even though we have uh, scholars and we have scholarship from the South, I'm talking about the global South, where we are located, um, where we belong, we proudly belong, and uh, we are getting very mature in a sense that uh, we can uh, very soon, and I think I have to attribute this to our dear colleague, Anna Duboki, who was, to me, was the first person who said, Sabi, why don't we talk about something like Elf Made in Brazil? So uh, uh, then, uh, and, and together with the contact with other, other areas that are in a way very, uh, let's say, are um, very update in the, especially through a critical lens. So then we are beginning to talk about something that we call Elf Made in Brazil. And then in a way, in a, in a nutshell, of course, uh, it, it refers, it means understanding Elf from within Brazilian context, uh, getting together and also uh, uh, dialoguing with decolonial studies in the, 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 the epistemologies of the South. And of course, because uh, even though we need to, to discuss this in a more, in a deeper, uh, let's say, uh, way, ELF, the concept is present in the new uh, Common Core curriculum, the BNCC. So of course, there are gaps to be filled out, but it's there. So then I think it can be the bait for us to, to uh, you know, take the concept and see how can how it can help materialize the premises of the the whole field into dlt class yes eduardo can you go to the next one so then uh having said that uh basically on the question that was made to us so um, one concern that i see over the years of experience that i have so whenever we discuss especially through a critical lens. So anything related to something that can imply or that, that have implications into the classroom, the uh, teachers ask very common, they, very commonly they ask this question. Yes, uh, Sabi, this is interesting, but how can I apply this into my own practice? How can I bring this into the classroom, right? So then uh, this is one of the, I would say, one of the, the, the sub areas that we, especially in our, in our context, we try to see the applications or we try to see how can, how ELF can illuminate, you know, the uh, teachers or practitioners common practice, let's say everyday uh, practice. And then the question, how can we teach English as a lingua franca locally? It means that we are thinking of locality. So it means that we are thinking of our context. So then we are going to uh, try to explore this question uh, with another question. So the second question is, first things first, is ELF teachable? Are we talking about uh, a, a new set of uh, you know, methodologies or uh, practices to replace another one? We know that in our country, 
So we basically ELT is ELF, EFL oriented, English as a, fel, as a foreign language. And then uh, changing the, the two letters is not just changing. So there is a, there is a difference there. And, and then we are going to, to show that uh, we are talking about something different. So uh, that's why uh, many, many colleagues and, and people who are doing research, so they prefer to, uh, whenever it comes to the implications to the classroom, they prefer to use the term health awareness, right? So it's not just replacing EFL with health. So then uh, the question is there, is health teachable? So then our, our answer, of course, it can be a question. <laughs> Uh, we do not think of health as teachable. Rather, we prefer to think of pedagogical implications of health. And of course, is this health awareness. And we are going to show later how we can, uh, you know, thinking of this health awareness, how can we transform our EFL classes into health aware classes? So we also see uh, the there is a pedagogical uh, space for health in the English classroom. So, and of course we have to see, you know, reading the materials, reading what we have produced, research results, how can these developments can inform teaching practices? So, and, and that's why I like, uh, you know, we have a, 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 a a scholar from Greece, Nikos Sifakis, that probably many of you uh, have heard of uh, and know. So he, he uh, one thing that he defends is that we should not see ELF against EFL, but ELF with EFL. So the two working together, especially because the classroom is a, a more formal, let's put it this way, uh, space, and, but, there is a, but, but it cannot be detached from real life, you see? So then uh, we cannot teach a language that people will not speak. We cannot expect our students to be interacting with native speakers of English because uh, the, this, this possibility, when you think of the world today, uh, you know, it's, it's minor, right? So then uh, we have to see how can uh, these developments inform teaching practices. And of course, we have to think of the pedagogical implications that are based on developments and results of health-related research. So this is important. So in, in, in many ways, when we, when we say uh, trying to address the question locally, it means that my recipe, in quotes, that I apply here in my area not necessarily would be the same for someone who's in the interior of Santa Catarina, whose context is another one, and also because they may use English in a different way for different reasons. So this is, you know, the more local nowadays, we have to see ourselves like trying to, especially as teachers, I like to address the regular teacher. We have to be empowered to make our decisions. Say, I'm going to teach English, to my students because they will need, they told me they will need English for this. This is what, you know, matters to them. Not to be, uh, you know, because one day they might uh, be talking to an ideal native speaker. So this is the sense that we, uh, that we uh, you know, insist where ELF can enter as a, a, let's say, as in quotes again, a tool of empowerment, right? Okay, moving on. Uh, so, pedagogical implications of ELF, so then we have a, a brief summary here in the, what the literature says and of course what Edward and I believe. So then we have to see language as a dynamic means of communication, right? So this is obvious, but sometimes in 2020, so people still think that we can put language in boxes in the systematized, and that's why I like when I say that language is, we try to, 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 to dominate language, but language is always, it's a, it's a rebel. And then there is no way because, and this is a wonderful rebel because we try to put it in box, we try to put it on a leash and it goes, right? So 
we have to teach and discuss language awareness, rhetorical sensitivity, and negotiation strategies, so especially through pragmatic strategies. It's important, as I said, to think of uh, developing materials that are meaningful locally, right? Of course, we receive a book because it's easier. The book, uh, we have good books nowadays, especially after the Penali Day that began in 2011. So, but no book is perfect. So the teacher has to be empowered to, to play with the book. And if the teacher is self-aware nowadays, so, you know, I, I'm sure he, can, he or she can do wonderful things, right? So discuss the global spread and the politics of English. So we need to have critical eyes. So we, as Eduardo said, so there is this whole, you know, idea that English is beneficial, English is neutral. So there is no neutrality when it, when it, it comes to language. And then, of course, there is always a big industry behind English. Just for you to have an idea, I like a quote by Phillips when he says, the English empire gave way to the empire of English. Because today, for example, the ELT industry probably is the number one industry in Britain. So a, a lot of the, the Britain brands are not even Britain anymore, British anymore. So if you think of uh, Land Rover, even Harold's is not British anymore. So they still have, you know, and they will cling to this, which is the, 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 the English language. So uh, have students engage with local cultures in critical ways. Yes, so this whole idea of uh, why working on heavily on, on, on cultures, especially stereotypical elements from cultures that are so distant to us, or of course, cultures are always important, but then why not begin from the known? Sometimes people, the unknown is very attractive, we know, but sometimes we, we go deeper into the known to get to know the unknown, right? And always with a critical eye. Expose students to different varieties of English. Yes, this is sine qua non, under an elf perspective that uh, especially what we would call nativized Englishes or non-natives, non-native Englishes. So it means that this, these are the Englishes that, you know, we'll probably, will encounter, you know, more often around the world than, uh, you know, what the so-called native speaker, right? Uh, even even in, in places like London, New York. So if you take a taxi in New York, I doubt you're going to bump into a native speaker of English. So probably we'll have, uh, you know, you hear uh, Indian English, Pakistani English, uh, Bangladesh English, etc., etc. So if you go to even chic restaurants in, in, in different places in the U.S. or in, in Britain, the, 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 the kitchen, the, the, you know, the place will be full of people from different parts of the world. So awareness raising activities to make learners attentive and responsive to lingua franca manifestations of English they might encounter outside the classroom. Even if they, they for example, those students that say, well, why should I learn English if I'm not going anywhere? So today, uh, with the computers and, uh, of course, with technology, they can go anywhere on the contrary, right? So it depends on the opportunities, how we can trigger as teachers for these students to say, hey, the world is, you know, is there, just uh, look for that. One thing that is very important that uh, sometimes it became a buzzword and the people don't really understand what it means to be intercultural. So it's intercultural sensitivity or interculturality as a whole. Interculturality, again, is not a package where, you know, and or something that I read about and, and, I, and I say today, I'm, in, I'm, I'm an intercultural person. So when, if it involves people, there is always interculturality there, but we need to construct interculturality all the time. So interculturality is part of this interaction. Uh, also, when it comes to curricula in materials, um, again, attributing this to our friend, uh, Anna Dubok, we have to find the cracks or gaps in curriculum, even if we are working as teachers in, in, in very close systems. 
this is very common, I would say, the context or of, uh, of teachers who work in language institutes. So they, they don't have a lot of, you know, uh, uh, as we would say in Portuguese, jogo de cintura, in order to uh, play with the curriculum or the program or the syllabus, but they can. They can find these cracks. So they can, they can rupture a little bit this whole, this whole story and, and, and of course, uh, uh, give, give it, uh, bring an elf flavor uh, there. And finally, uh, out of this, so a focus on intelligibility, which is a very important uh, concept for, for elf studies. And uh, there are, I think it's, it's been very, very uh, one, one area, uh, especially phonology, pronunciation, etc., that has been, has been given a lot of attention on intelligibility. But this means that uh, uh, intel being intelligible uh, is different from this whole idea that uh, usually we, we hear when people say, oh, now you can speak any English as long as you are intelligible. And then, and then uh, oh, you can speak broken English and you are intelligible. So of course, this is very, uh, you know, it's, it's a sort of prejudice, but intelligibility means that you are able, you have the, the repertoires in order to make yourself intelligible, not only linguistic, but culture by semiotic in order, that's, in, that's what happens in the world, in the real world, right? Okay, and then um, moving on to the next, uh, the next slide, and I'll pass on to Eduardo. We have to, to, we are going now to go more, let's say in terms of practice, to the pedagogical implications of ELF are mainly local. How can we do that? So I'll pass on to Eduardo. Thank you, Savi. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, I hope everybody can still hear me. <laughs> right. uh, but uh, uh, so yes, the pedagogical. So what Savi has just said uh, was, you know, we broke down the question. You know, is Elf teachable first, and then how do we do this uh, locally, right? And as he also explained, we think of the pedagogical implications of Elf as being mainly local. Uh, we wanted to say always local, but we felt we might be challenged by that. <laughs> Somebody might challenge yeah. us. So we wanted to be, you know, uh, a little bit more careful and say mainly local. But what do we mean by this, right? What do we mean by saying that the pedagogical implications of ELF are mainly local, right? First, uh, we want to start by looking at what we mean by localizing ELF, right? And I'm going to talk about this from both the practical and a the theoretical standpoint, right? Uh, the first uh, uh, thing that I want to say in relation to that is I want, I want you to look at this bubble at the bottom here. Let's start from the bottom, right? Which is the idea and the understanding that, as we said, as both Savio and I said uh, from the beginning, communication is a situated practice. Communication happens situated uh, in different contexts, right? So uh, communication is not a set of norms or a set of rules or a set of, uh, uh, language is not a set of structures that determines communication. Communication happens in different uh, uh, practices and these practices are situated. What I mean by, what we mean by situated is, you know, it happens in the conversation you have, uh, uh, in the living room with, with a friend or, you know, it happens. And, and some people might say, okay, but what if you're talking to, you know, a thousand people like we are right now? I know it's not a thousand, but you know, <laughs> I'm just joking. But uh, what if you're talking to a thousand people? Is that situated and you're doing this online? Still situated because that particular context in which you were talking and that particular situation and the topic, everything there is situated. It is, uh, uh, so communication, uh, uh, is a situated practice and it happens locally all the time, right? Communication only happens locally, right? Uh, even if that local is not necessarily physical, uh, uh, but, you know, virtual, digital, uh, uh, it happens in different ways, right? Now, uh, localizing ELF from a theoretical standpoint uh, uh, also means that uh, we localize the field uh, where the field of ELF started as a whole. And Savio already mentioned, you know, looking at ELF with a Brazilian flavor or, you know, looking at ELF uh, uh, from a Brazilian perspective, right? But what we mean by this bubble here at the top, which is the orange bubble, is uh, for you to be able to localize ELF, you need to understand that the theories that started out, you know, and, and that are called ELF, 
they started out somewhere, right? And we bring, uh, we're borrowing this from, you know, uh, the colonial studies and uh, I, I would say, especially Walter Mignolo's idea that you have to provincialize knowledges, right? And this idea that, you know, although many times we take these knowledges as universal, you know, elf emerges as a field of study or as an area of study and people start to think, oh, you know, this is great, and, and, but people start to understand this as universal. Well, these people are located somewhere and they come from somewhere and they're developing these theories based on their reality somewhere. So trying to understand and to provincialize those realities, which means trying to understand why those theories make sense in those realities, why those theories make sense in those contexts is very important for that, right? Uh, and then, if you look at the bubble on the left, at least for me, it's my left, we signify elf locally from a theoretical standpoint too. What that means is, okay, just because I'm saying that that theory makes sense in a specific place, it doesn't mean that I have to reject it or that it doesn't make sense here, but I have to resignify it, or at least uh, uh, we believe that resignifying it and understanding how it makes sense here and how sometimes it might not make sense here or how you know, some elements of it might not make sense here is important too for us to localize elf, right? And the last bubble here uh, for us to uh, talk about localizing elf, which I think is the most important one for this presentation is this idea of constructing local teaching practices, right? Like Savio mentioned, right? So looking at teaching practices that make sense for particular localities, for particular contexts, for particular places, for the realities of particular students and particular uh, uh, teachers and professors, right? And uh, we are going to address this uh, uh, in a little bit more depth or in a little bit more detail as we move on. Before we move on though, uh, let's just say that uh, uh, when we were talking about this, uh, Savio said, Eduardo, let's add another bubble <laughs> and say that, you know, the intersection of these four bubbles is where ELF is made locally, right? Is where ELF is made in Brazil, for example. And like he said, you know, uh, Ana Duboki and himself, Savio, have been discussing this and Clarissa Jordão have been talking about this idea of ELF made locally, right? Thelma Jimenez and others too, right? Have been talking about ELF made mm -hmm. locally, ELF made in Brazil. And uh, uh, it's nice for us to see that, you know, this intersection works as a, a good space for us to think about this ELF made in Brazil or in different localities. And when we say Brazil in, in parts of Brazil or in specific contexts within Brazil, so uh, uh, localizing ELF for us has to do with the intersection of these four things here, right? Uh, now, also before I move on, uh, I do apologize for the messiness of this slide, but it was because of the program I used, right? Uh, the program that we used to construct them, but um, it's uh, language is messy. So we thought, okay, let's not change that, messy right? Business. It kind of represents the messiness of language itself too, right? Uh, so when we think about constructing local teaching practices, like I said, going back to the previous slide, uh, we're thinking about constructing local teaching practices more in, in more detail from now on, right? What does that mean, right? And for Savio and myself, when we talked about this, there is a meta level to that. Right? There is a level that you know, applies to uh, uh, different contexts that could apply to different contexts in different ways, of course, because even those questions should be made locally, right? But uh, which we think is uh, are really important, right? So for example, these are some reflections that we think uh, teachers, professors, instructors in general can have with students and they should be ongoing, they should be continuous, right? And, and that should bring different insights in each different individual context, right? So for example, whose norms, and we say norms, quote unquote, right, uh, should count in this class, right? And why? Should we just simply assume that a standard British or a standard American English is what counts in this class? And why should we assume that? I mean, does that make sense for this class? Usually it doesn't. So, you know, can we, uh, uh, discuss that and can we uh, 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 deepen our discussion in relation to that, right? Another question is, is there room for translanguaging, right? And perhaps the notion of translanguaging is not familiar to many people, so I'm going to try to explain very simply, right? But uh, uh, of course the theory is much more uh, uh, complex than that. But uh, uh, what we mean by this question is, I mean, can people 
if this is an English class, can people use other semiotic resources as they construct meaning and as they learn English? Can they use Spanish, for example? Can they use Portuguese, right? Can they use uh, uh, signs and, and, and pictures and their cell phones and, and you know, can, can, or should this be an English only class, which, you know, uh, a lot of schools, language schools say, oh, you know, this is English only now. Does it make sense to be English only? Can we, can we not use the affordances of other languages to build up on those affordances and learn English and help uh, uh, and, and construct meaning in different ways, right? So uh, that's another question that can be asked. And that can be, and, uh, like we said here in the title of the slide, when we say reflections with students, these are questions not only for the professor or the teacher to ask themselves, but for them to, you know, discuss with our students, right? Uh, another question, how should each assignment be assessed, right? And why, right? I mean, uh, uh, and we do that a lot. Uh, uh, some colleagues and myself at WFBAHI, we do that, right? Uh, we look at, you know, writing classes, for example. Okay, what should we look at in this writing piece, right? and ask the students, okay, sometimes they construct their own rubric, you know, should we look at organ, depending on the type of writing, and Savio talked about, you know, rhetorical sensitivity and language awareness uh, before, and the idea of pragmatics before, you know, why, uh, I mean, why should we pay attention to this in this assignment and that in that assignment? How, how, should, it, how should this assignment be assessed? Uh, uh, should we look at more organization? Should we correct grammar? Does it make sense to correct grammar? If, if the student is writing a tweet, if the student is writing a WhatsApp message, if the assignment is something like that, does it make sense? Does it make sense to think about correction at all? I'm not saying that it makes, that it makes sense or that it doesn't. I'm saying that these questions should be reflected locally with students, at least in our view, right? Uh, this next question here, how are meanings created and negotiated in our interactions? We think of this as a question that should be continuously uh, uh, thought about and discussed by students, uh, uh, especially in classes. So, you know, students do pair work, they do group work, they, can, they talk to the teacher, they do presentations. In each one of those moments, how are they constructing meaning? How are they negotiating meaning? So at the end of a paired discussion, for example, okay, how did you construct meaning? Did you use Portuguese? Did you use your cell phone? Were you in front of a computer? Did you use images? What happened in, in, in your interaction? And the reason why we say that is because having these discussions with students continuously helps them realize, okay, meanings are not constructed just by this grammar that, you know, uh, I thought it, it, uh, existed in the minds of individuals as a fixed thing, but, you know, meanings are constructed through various different modes uh, of interaction in various different ways. And, you know, when I talked to this colleague, it was one way, but when I talked to that other colleague, it was another way. And when I was in this group of people here, it was different. And when I talked to the professor or the teacher, you know, in looking at each one of these individual moments and having these discussions, we think is important, uh, uh, is an important reflection for students to build language awareness into how meanings are created and negotiated in different interactions, right? Also, this fifth question here, what kind of feedback do we want from the teacher and from the peers, right? And uh, uh, this I think is, is, is really interesting because uh, uh, in, uh, I've, I've talked to a few colleagues about this in writing especially. I have a colleague, Juliana Martinez uh, and myself, we teach a writing one class or we did, right? And we've usually been investigating our own, uh, we haven't written about this yet or we haven't presented about this yet, but we've have investigated the, our own feedback practices, the feedback practices that we have with our own students. I mean, can they reflect ELF? And can they, and this is the professors thinking, right? But the students themselves also, what kind of feedback do you want? I also have a colleague, uh, Clarissa Jordão, and, and she can correct me later <laughs> if, if I'm wrong, right? But uh, uh, she says that uh, in her oral classes at UFPA, she'll ask the students, she'll ask, okay, do you want me to correct every moment that I think you, you made a quote unquote mistake? And then mm -hmm. students say yes, and then she starts to do it and students think, okay, but then it doesn't make sense for me to communicate that, that kind of like blocks communication. I think that kind of reflection helps students realize, you know, uh, 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 and helps students take ownership also of, you know, the practices that are taking place in the classroom together with the professor, with the teacher, of course, uh, as well, right? 
And also, how would you assess your own performance, right? And I know that this happens in many other classes, right? This is not only elf based. And a lot of these questions are not only elf based, but we do think that, you know, having a look at those uh, questions from a local perspective and bringing an elf perspective and an elf awareness, as Savio said, to those questions deepens the level of those questions and can uh, deepen the, the, the language awareness and the rhetorical sensitivity and uh, uh, the, the intercultural sensitivity as well that students will build or that we can uh, build together with students in our class. Right? But now we're gonna move on to some examples of our own, of things that we think <laughs> we've been involved with, right? And that reflect uh, 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 elf in practice, right? Or uh, uh, elf awareness in practice, uh, 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 rather, right? And I'm gonna pass it back to Savio and he's gonna start with those, right? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all right. So then I think one, one of the, the main concerns as, as uh, you know, I have already said is that teachers ask us how, how can we uh, put this into practice? How can we uh, really bring our awareness to the classroom? And then one way of doing this is to approach pre-existing materials if, because uh, sometimes we tell teachers, why don't you produce your own material? And we know that, uh, you know, besides taking time, not everybody is prepared uh, to prepare materials. So uh, it's, this is simply that we, you know, not every wonderful professor or teacher is a good materials writer or will be a textbook writer. So that's, you know, this doesn't work. So then, uh, of course, the textbook is still very strong in our, you know, ELT let's say practices so then one way of uh, you know trying to to bring elf awareness to the classroom is to work with pre-existing materials uh, that can be approached or extended you know uh, with an elf awareness and I'm going to give two examples and then I'll pass on again to Eduardo so the two examples of course we don't have the time for more but just for us to to think that uh, how, can, how, how these books are sometimes, they try to be, you know, uh, let's say elf oriented, but they, they, they fall into a trap. So can we see the image please, Eduardo? So if you look here, this is, this is uh, I like, this is a Brazilian book of English and uh, it was approved by PN, the, the PNLD. And this is the unit one. And if you look here, uh, it has, uh, you know, the title of the unit is English Everywhere. So then, and of course, they have here uh, a sign that uh, you have the, 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 the word alubacy and to hire in, in, in English. So, of course, we know uh, uh, who this, I mean, the, the ones who put this, the, the sign there want to address. But as Eduardo mentioned, so this simple thing, this, this, this semiotic, of this image can be a wonderful trigger for, for, for teachers to discuss, for example, translingual practices. So expand, right? Uh, because there you have in the book, you have English and Portuguese together with a very, let's say, a very uh, active uh, or a very uh, practical way of using English. So if you travel uh, to different places in Brazil, we are going to see and we see uh, attempts, sometimes very, very uh, interesting attempts to translate, you know, uh, from Portuguese to English, especially uh, restaurant menus. They are very creative with Google Translator and uh, they end up like doing wonderful things for, for us that, uh, you know, work with translingual practices, etc. But then if you look here, the trap I'm going to talk about is English everywhere. And then they bring two pictures. So, uh, and look at the pictures. So, the, the try to, to detach that idea that English is not only Britain or America, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. English is everywhere. But then the next page, they fall into the trap of the native speaker, let's say, or the, the, the societies where English is spoken as a, as a native language. And then you have a picture from London, and of course, a picture of a kangaroo that reminds us that takes us to Australia. 
So then what happens is English everywhere, if it's everywhere, why the traditional, let's say, Australia less, but anyway, it's still a place where English is spoken as a, is part of the Commonwealth, et cetera, et cetera. So then what happens, the teacher can basically, you know, eliminate these pictures. They can work on the different questions that we have there and bring real pictures of English used in countries where, you know, English is, is can be a, a second language, can be an official language like India or combinations from different countries in Africa, but then, you know, not necessarily the, the, the traditional, uh, let's say, uh, or the dominant cultures, right? So this is one example. The second one is the famous uh, advice columns. If we go to the next slide. So this is a, a very common exercise in books uh, for, for, for students to practice, especially should as uh, you know, the model should, you should do this. So you, the person writes a, uh, you know, to, uh, to an advice column and then the person gives uh, advice, et cetera, et cetera. So then, but if you look at this, of course it is, it is prefabricated. So then it's beautifully, let's say, uh, cleaned up. But then this is okay, as long as you can expand. And then I have an example. And then of course there are thousands of examples in the real world where you can bring real English in, in especially from multicultural societies. So this is in, in, in the, uh, uh, if you look at the next slide, there is a, an exact, an exact uh, advice column, but then uh, with a more sophisticated, let's say, let's put it this way, uh, uh, type of English. And, and also the, the context is totally different. This is a, uh, uh, a, a, a newspaper, an online paper, uh, for an Australian com Indian, uh, uh, an Indian community in Australia. So, and then they use uh, Indian words from, from, for example, the, and it begins with the names instead of Debbie, Peter, Mark, whatever, whatever. Look, that is the and G, which is a, you know, a weird name for us. But again, this is the world. So this is, it's just looking at these things from a different, a different uh, eye. So then in, in the, if you look here, so, uh, you know, the situation is, is, is very interesting because uh, uh, not this, let's say, usually books bring, uh, when they use uh, advice column, they bring very simple things, not to hurt anybody, very politically correct ideas. Of course, this is not, you know, uh, po politically incorrect, but then they use, they bring words like, for example, uh, he drinks a lot of beer. He usually has a pot belly. So that's, you know, totally different than you would find in the book because the book has to follow some protocols, right? So then in, in they even use words, for example, the word, if you look here, I'm a svelte apsara. So this is, apsara is a word that comes from Hindi. So then they translanguage, translanguage a little bit. So then uh, it would be a little bait for the student to be uh, exposed to the real world. This is just an example that you can, you don't have to simply take everything away or throw everything away from the existing materials, but you can expand and of course say, well, this is, you know, what we can do, uh, we go beyond what happens uh, usually in, in, in our practices, especially with materials. So then now I, I take it back to, to, back to Eduardo because it's going to continue. Okay, okay, thank you, Sav. And uh, the next two examples are from uh, uh, experiences that I have had. Uh, the first one was actually uh, uh, something that I thought about bringing to this presentation after I saw uh, the live where Savi participated with uh, uh, Professor Javier Gopalan and uh, the professors in Tocantins and students in Tocantins, as I mentioned before, right? And in that, uh, uh, in that particular presentation, I remember that uh, uh, in that particular live, uh, Savio asked the question, okay, what happens with curricula, right? And he was saying, okay, different curricula. And, I'm t and here we're talking about specifically 
teacher education curriculum, right? Teacher education curriculum. And I remember Savi was asking, and I believe it was you, Savi, correct me if I'm wrong later, right? You were asking, okay, I, there, there's a teacher education curricula in different parts where, you know, applied linguistics is only part of the curriculum. How can we have ELF? Or that ELF is merely touched based upon, you know, in, 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 uh, uh, in a class or in a discipline. So what I'd like to present is uh, uh, the, not the whole curriculum, of course, but it's something that we did locally here at UFPR. Uh, this is a curriculum that was approved uh, uh, in December last year and that we have just started to implement here. I mean, we are in the middle of a pandemic, so that has been a little hard, right? But uh, we have started to implement here. And what we did with this curriculum was we made applied linguistics central to the curriculum. So this is, so when Savi was asking, okay, you know, in, in many curricula across the country, you know, applied linguistics is something that is, you know, uh, tangential, if you will, right? It's just something that people touch based on. We developed a curriculum that is an applied linguistics centered curriculum. That doesn't mean it's elf centered, right? That's just applied linguistics centered, right? But uh, as, I, as I'm gonna try to show you, we have uh, 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 elements in this curriculum and other things related to the curriculum that I think leave a lot of room for elf to be addressed not only as a specific class, not only as a moment of a class, but across the curriculum. And I think this is really important, right? First, because we have, you know, uh, uh, these two uh, uh, applied linguistics classes, of course, but we do have discussions on interculturality in this class here, Cultura Ensino de Línguas Estrangeiras Modernas. We do have a class that addresses uh, uh, English in uh, contemporary times, right? We do have a class that addresses teacher education in times of globalization, right? We do have classes on issues related to multiliteracies, which will involve, you know, multimodality and constructing meaning in different ways using different semiotic resources, as I mentioned here, right? We do have classes that address concepts of language and concepts of discourse, right? So although this curriculum is not ELF-centered, I do think it does address the need for, you know, more ELF awareness within curricular, teacher education curricula, not only because of the classes themselves, but because the professors who built the curriculum, the applied linguistics professors who built the curriculum, you know, myself and, and my colleagues, you know, pretty much every single one of us is either working with ELF, or, uh, or elf related practice, or at least, you know, has readings in the, in the field or discusses this w with one another. Uh, so, you know, the, the fact that it was built locally, and oh, I, I must stress this too, it was built not only locally, but it was built based on the question that, uh, uh, that we had throughout the whole process, which was, what do we want our students to know and to do as they go on and become teachers in the local spaces and in the different spaces we have in our city, in our state, in our country. So it was very much build, built on local necessities, on the realities that we had as teachers. And we do, we, I do believe that we found spaces to include elf awareness in many different uh, 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 classes there, right? And I'm only illustrating some here, but we have other classes too that I think uh, uh, would illustrate that uh, uh, as well. Uh, the second example I want to bring uh, has to do with translanguaging and identity, right? Uh, 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 I know that some of uh, some people who have been my students uh, are, are watching this, right? So they have probably seen me give this as an example, but not in the way that I'm going to do right now, right? Mm -hmm. So this is a passage taken from Borderlands by Gloria Ansaldua. Uh, uh, and this is a passage that became famous, right? Uh, uh, and where she translanguages a lot, right? And she's translanguaging a lot because she comes from, you know, a borderland, because she, she's addressing this idea of la frontera, right? And uh, so it's very important uh, uh, in the, the construction of this uh, uh, part of this passage and of the book itself, you know, that she does that, right? Now I've done, I've, I've worked with this text and I'm gonna show the rest of the text in a little bit, uh, uh, the passage in a little bit, but uh, uh, I've worked with this with different classes and di at different moments at different levels uh, to discuss this idea of, you know, deconstructing monolithic static notions of language, of culture, of English, of identity, and so on, right? And uh, 
the reason I'm bringing it here is because I've recently, and I haven't done this yet, but I've recently thought that we can take this a step further, right? So Gloria and Saldua, just to give an example, she says, to live in the borderlands means you are neither Hispana, India, Negra, Española, ni Gabacha, eres mestiza, mulata, half-breed, caught in the crossfire between camps while carrying all five races on your back, not knowing which side to turn to. To live in the borderlands means knowing that the India in you betrayed for 500 years, oh, I can't see the rest because uh, the, my screen is here, uh, is no longer speaking to you, that Mexicanas call you rajetas, that denying the Anglo inside you is as bad as having denied the Indian or black. So she is, and I'm not going to read the whole thing, but she is deconstructing this idea of, you know, identity and uh, monolithic static identity within uh, uh, a culture, within uh, a specific space, considering this idea of the borderlands. The way I've thought about using this in class and in different classes and in different levels uh, and taking a step further is, okay, this text, let's provincialize this text. Like I said, provincialize elf, right? Okay, this text makes sense to a particular locality. Why does it make sense to that particular locality? Why does it make sense for her to trans language in that locality? How is she constructing meaning? How is she constructing sense? At the same time, I think students could perhaps reconstruct this text or construct similar texts, not necessarily using poetry, but using prose, where they talk about their own localities and they think, okay, does it make sense for me to translanguage in my own localities? And when I say localities, I don't say, oh, let, let's talk about Curitiba. To live in Curitiba means you, I'm not saying that. I'm thinking of locality, not only as a place, but as an identity, as, uh, 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 as a community that makes sense to you. You could say, for example, to live in, in a specific neighborhood or to work at a specific place or, to work at WFPR means you, right? Or to be involved in elf research means you, or to have a son means you, or, you know, and you can, and maybe one of the questions we could have with the students is, does it make sense to write this in English? But, you know, if it is an English class, then we can even ask, okay, so we want to force the idea that you have to write in English. So think about identities and localities that make sense for you to write this in English, right? So maybe you could say, to be an online gamer means you, instead of to live in Curitiba means you, because being an online gamer is a space or a, a context in which you use more English. So not only constructing the text itself, which I think the text itself is what matters the least, but the idea of developing an awareness while constructing the text, while thinking about the communities you're part of, while, I think, while thinking why English makes sense in these communities and not in these others, uh, uh, while thinking about you as an English uh, a speaker in this community and not in this other community, I think that this type of reflection is rich for students to have and for them to understand and to deconstruct monolithic, uh, uh, homogeneous ideas of culture, of language, of identity, and so on and so forth. So it's just a, a, an example. Like I said, I haven't done this, but I've thought about because I like this so much. <laughs> I've thought about exploring this in different ways, and I think this is one of them, right? Uh, now, we want to finish with some inconclusive words, right? Uh, I know that we've gone over our time, but I hope some of you are still with us, right? Uh, and these inconclusive words are from uh, two people that I'm very fortunate to work with and to be close with, right? One is a, a colleague, as a professor, and the other, uh, Savio and I were in his doctoral uh, uh, committee, right? Uh, yeah. Banca de Defesa, right? But he's part of one of our research groups, right? And uh, Savio suggested that we include that. So Savio, please, can you uh, close for us? Uh, yeah, <laughs> thank you. So actually, I, <clears throat> I'm not using my, my microphone. Uh, I'm using the computer's microphone because I was told the sound was bad. So I hope it's better now. <clears throat> can you hear me all right? Okay, so then uh, actually, uh, before we, we we read the quote, Eduardo, I am a big fan of Gloria Ansaldu, as I, I, I love her book, actually her books, and uh, La Frontera is is amazing because uh, she says that she, uh, as, as uh, a Chicana, as she calls herself, and she is a Chicana, she says, I can move from uh, English to Spanish you know, I can have eight different dialects, so eight different languages. So, and, and, and this is wonderful. 
just just by having been born into a Hispanic family uh, in the United States. But anyway, so the our inconclusive words are you know on purpose inconclusive because you know knowledge is always you know inconclusive. So then uh, uh, I I think this is a great quote from our uh, colleagues that Eduardo has mentioned already. So. Uh, they say, we see ELF as a specific context of language use uh, that produces language forms and ways of interacting and communicating markedly different from those expected from traditional contexts. So ELF means using English as, means use, English used as a lingua franca among multilingual speakers in contextualized practices. So hopefully this can give you, uh, give the audience a, a broad idea uh, of what we are trying to say, right, in terms of uh, what ELF is, if ELF is really teachable, and we all have already said that it's not, it's something different. But again, I think, uh, we think that we can say that ELF is teaching English with an attitude. So it means this attitude is not arrogant. So this attitude means it's teaching English critically. So bringing all these ideas and, and, and the results and the, you know, uh, whatever comes out of this discussion that is here to add, right? To, to, uh, to make our ELT practices more interesting, more local, et cetera, et cetera. So then, I'll pass on to Eduardo to finish up. All right, so the last slide we have, I mean, the second to last slide we have for you is just, uh, as I promised, you know, we don't have citations here, but we do, we did promise references, right? So uh, I just wanna mention that uh, we, uh, there's a, a list of references on ELF uh, and, and related uh, 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 areas that's been constructed by a group of scholars uh, across Brazil, right? This group is called Ilfbre, right? It's a group that in, uh, uh, Savio is part of this group and people like Thelma Jimenez, Clarissa Jordão, Ana Paula Duboc, Michele Elcadri and, and others. And I was recently included to that group. I was very honored to and be And we included. want to expand it. <laughs> and we want to expand it, right? And that group, one of the actions that that group has decided to do is, you know, construct uh, 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 a list of references for people who, you know, are beginning or even for people who want to expand on studies of ELF and uh, we created this list of references here. So there is a website here that you can, and I'm also going to add the website here. I always wanted to do this, so I'm doing this right now, right? I'm going to put it on the comment right here uh, uh, where you are. I'm going to uh, put the, the tiny URL uh, website there and uh, so that you can just click there and access the, the website with references, right? And many of these references uh, are base what we said here during this presentation. And uh, we want to just finish by saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, right? Obrigado, very, muito obrigado. <laughs> in a very varied way, right? So yeah. thank you very much. And uh, we are open to questions, suggestions, comments, ideas. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Eduardo and Savio, for this very provocative and informative presentation. Um, if you, I hope you can see me and you can hear me well. I must say that you know that I'm at my home right now, as we all are, but the neighbor from up upstairs is making, is making horrible construction noises, so if oh my, my audio gets inaudible, I'll ask Rosani to jump in and help me with the questions, okay? Um, we have some very juicy ones, some very juicy questions. I'll, ask, I'll begin with the questions that I collected on the YouTube chat, okay? So I'll just ask the questions and you feel free to jump in and address it, okay? Okay. Uh, so the first one is from Professor Clarissa Jordão. Thank you very much, Clarissa, for being here with us. Uh, she says, would you say there might be an ELF 
fourth phase based on deconnectality and translingualism that is being perhaps led by Brazilian scholars? Could English as a lingua franca made in Brazil be this ELF fourth phase? Uh, well, I, I'll, I'll answer and then I'll pass on to Eduardo. Uh, Clarissa, this is a great, I hadn't thought about this, but this is, uh, let me tell you, this could be a possibility. Uh, of course, when we, we made a point in the presentation of having a bubble there, uh, referring to ILF in Brazil, based on what we have been discussing, especially on the colonial studies, I, I I, I really think it's, it, it would be interesting to, to think of uh, uh, a, a different phase, really, uh, as we are in many ways detached from, from uh, the other ones. So I hadn't thought about this, but then thank you for bringing this up because this could be something that we, we, we ourselves, so the, 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 the scholars who have been involved with ELF, with ELF in Brazil, could argue for. So uh, in, in now phase, uh, let's say, uh, more local, of course, and then uh, this can be the like sowing the seeds for similar contexts, especially here in Latin America, for us to, to, to even expand this. Because I think, for example, this could encompass other uh, colleagues from other countries, from Argentina, from uh, from Peru, from from you know, from Latin America in general. So then, I hadn't thought about this, but I think we should be thinking of uh, of a an L four phase. This is true. Thank you. I don't know what Eduardo thinks. <laughs> Thanks. I'm, I'm going to say I agree, but before I do, Alison, do you want me to? I'm going to close the the sharing, so I think it's better for everyone. I just left it here for a little bit because uh, you know if anybody wanted to copy the, the the address for the references, but I'm gonna stop now and get to this mode, which I think is easier, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I agree completely, Savio. I think it's a very provocative question. I think it's a very good question. I think it's, uh, uh, and because it is a very provocative question, I think, you know, uh, uh, it might be the idea that, you know, some of us, uh, maybe all of us, I don't know, uh, uh, start to think this through and maybe write a piece about this, you know, and I think it's a nice way for somebody to, uh, uh, for scholars in the South to respond to this idea of elves from the North in a way that, you know, is open to the ideas from the North, but that's also given our flavor, right, our, our yeah. you know, uh, 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 and bringing this decolonial, uh, de these decolonial studies and epistemologies of uh, uh, the oh, South yeah. into the picture. Yeah. yeah, I think it's very nice. Uh, and I think it, let's work uh, it would together be very provocative. This. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think it would be very provocative to the people in the North. I think it would be provocative yes. for them too. So yeah, Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Absolutely. yeah. Um, when Clarissa asked that question, Professor Ana Paula Duboki provoked her and I like to share what Ana Paula said. Uh -huh. um, Ana Paula said, please, please. Do céu fala em transmodernidade para marcar que o decolonial não é pós e não continua aquele debate. And then here comes a question. Até que ponto a gente se colocar como fase 4, phase 4, não daria a impressão de que estamos continuando aquele debate? O que precisamos é de um ELF turn, não? Um ELF what? Turn. Uma virada. Yeah, this, uh, I don't know if I should well, should keep to English. I mean, well, I, I this is also this is a good this is a good point also. So then um, I, re, I was thinking here when I when I answered Clarissa, uh, if. Uh, if we, if we consider L4 uh, a phase, it means that it's a continuation of what came before. So then, but again, Anna, Anna has a point too. So then uh, uh, we could uh, get detached from this and then uh, come up with, or, uh, you know, something that derives from other, let's say other sources. So then uh, I think both, both, uh, let's say questions are very provocative 
and uh, I, I, I believe it, it requires more, let's say, uh, it, it requires more investigation for us to decide which path to follow. So I, I don't have an answer immediately, but I think both arguments, both are, uh, uh, you know, both arguments are, are really worth considering. So uh, thank you, Ana Paula, for also, uh, you know, bring this up. Let's get together uh, and, and then uh, uh, elaborate together on, on which path we are going to follow. But both are, are very interesting. Thank you. Again, I must agree with Savi, right? Uh, I, I do think that, uh, and I think both of them, uh, Clarissa and Ana Paula, for, for the questions, right? Because they are very provocative. I think the reflection has already started, even before we started answering the questions, you know, the fact that Clarissa asked the question and Ana Paula, you know, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. started reflecting upon that. I think the reflection is even prior to us saying that. I do think that the, the dialogue they had in the chat, which, you know, I haven't seen, but uh, uh, already shows that it's a complex question, that it needs to be addressed carefully and with reflection. And I think with a group of people, you know, with different people thinking this together and, and yeah. uh, uh, thinking of the best way of addressing this. Because one thing that seems clear to me, uh, uh, not only from, you know, my conversations with Savi before the presentation, also, which I think are clear from the presentation itself and from this uh, uh, exchange between Clarice and Ana Paula is, Decolonial studies and epistemologies of the South are becoming very present in the way scholars in Brazil are thinking about health and perhaps scholars in other places in Latin America as well, right? Uh, we mm -hmm. do know of one person who's not necessarily working with health as far as I know, but in Colombia, Miguel, who is uh, a part of our group and who's discussing a lot of uh, uh, issues related to decoloniality too. So one thing that seems clear to me, independently of which path we're going to take, is there is an urge or there is a need, right, for yep. this to, for this kind of discussion to happen. And uh, uh, the direction it will take, you know, it will depend on how the discussion develops. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you, Savio and Eduardo. I'll move on to the next question now. Uh, this question is from Camila House, Eduardo's advisee. She says, you've mentioned health as a phenomenon and an area of studies. How would you explain L as a phenomenon? Would you say that, is it, that it is a function of English in a specific interactions? Can't we think of L only as a framework to look at all interactions involving English, considering, for example, translanguaging as a rule for all communication? Mm -hmm. Well, Eduardo, you go first now. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll go first. Uh, it's the, wait, there's a message here. The, the host has spotlighted your video. Would you like to unmute your microphone? I don't know. I'm not going to, I'm going to unmute myself. Okay. Can you hear me? <laughs> yes. It was yes. a message from some action you took, Alison, that came to, to me. But uh, I think it's a very complex question. I do think that uh, uh, one thing that I think is very important with uh, what Savi presented on the phenomenon and the area of studies is, and I think this, this is a, a, a important for us to say, and Camila, like Alison said, is my advisee, so she might have heard this from me before, is I think it's important to differentiate these things because ELF is a phenomenon, uh, uh, and Savi can have a different opinion from me on this, and I believe other scholars will too, but ELF as a phenomenon is not studied solely by scholars who are studying ELF as an area, right? And this is important, right? I, I think that people like uh, uh, Alistair Pennycook, for example, or even uh, uh, Haja Gopalan here in Brazil, or, uh, uh, you know, or Suresh Kanagaraja, and these people might correct me if they ever hear this, but, you know, they don't necessarily align with, you know, ELF as an area, but they're still discussing ELF as a phenomenon. And the, the implications of ELF, and not only pedagogical, but sociocultural, political, uh, uh, and many other economical even, right, implications of this. So I think the importance of distinguishing the phenomenon from the area of study is there is an area of studies called ELF, right? This area of studies is very important, it's solid, and we are dialoguing with this area. But not everybody who's studying ELF as a phenomenon comes from this area of study, right? Mm -hmm. There are people 
I would say that the works of, for example, Jan Blomark, right, uh, uh, also dialogue with the global spread of English and with how English is being conceptualized in different places. And uh, uh, it is an important uh, uh, thing for people to read too, right? Uh, his books mm -hmm. and his, his works are important for people to read too. So I think the distinction is important because, you know, Elf uh, uh, before, and, and I've heard Savio say this before, so I think you will agree, Elf before anything else is a phenomenon, right? It's something that's happening, right? It is this global spread and the, the, the fact that people are using, uh, the people that are communicating in English uh, uh, rather, uh, uh, in several different parts of the world is something that's happening. And not everybody who's looking into this phenomenon are within, you know, are, are not, not everybody who's looking at this phenomenon is going to the ELF conferences or is publishing in the Journal of English as a lingua franca. So yeah. this distinction is important to make. Do I think of ELF as a function? That's, that's uh, uh, um, an important question. I do think that uh, uh, one way of understanding ELF is as a function. But I think, uh, and I think that's, that's good, and I think that that, that is a, a good way of, of thinking of ELF. Uh, I think that uh, it does go beyond that if we look at the phenomenon and other things too. But I think looking at it as a function is one of the possible ways of, of looking into it. Uh, I don't know if I answered Camilla's question, Savi, do you wanna add? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I, I agree. So I guess I see, I see ELF as a function and not as, as, because usually when we contrast function and, and, and variation, so ELF is not a variation. Yes, so agreed. Yeah, a variety. Agree. Yeah, yeah. So it is a function. So then is English working as, 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 as functioning as a lingua franca. So the phenomenon, as you said, so can be studied from in numerous different ways uh not only even not only in linguistic areas so then uh, you can study the spread of english from different perspectives uh, historical perspectives uh, geographical perspectives sociolinguistic perspectives so then uh in within linguistic studies so uh, the spread, what calls the attention as we said at the beginning is that we never had a language that spread you know, as much as English in the way it spread. So how it influences, uh, in all, all that encompasses a powerful language like English, you know, invading spaces, literally invading spaces historically. So then if you, and even within linguistic studies, so of course a British uh, scholar will see English in a different way from an Indian scholar. Because you know the the way uh, the, the, what English means to the Indian scholar is very different from what English means to uh, you know to the historic the, the British uh, uh, scholar. So then uh, it is the phenomenon is there, and of course we can look at the phenomenon from a world English perspective. We can look at the phenomenon uh, or English as a global language perspective, English as a international language perspective, and that is ELF. And of course, sometimes this ELF terminology is confusing because, you know, it, it is maybe the most recent field of studies to uh, uh, study ELF, and uh, uh, also because it became, you know, uh, the lingua franca terminology is confusing. So then what happens, the, the, the phenomenon, uh, I think the, 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 the field is still a baby field. And uh, uh, despite the fact that we have a lot of research already, so it, it's still, it still needs more and more, uh, let's say, uh, results and in investigations in order to be as, for example, as solid as world English is. That is, it dates back from the 50s when Braj Kasho began, you know, discussing uh, nativized English, post-colonial English, etc. So then, uh, the, the, and I think we are at this moment, for example, I think she mentioned ELF as, as a framework. Yeah, there is a framework there that sees uh, English as English within, within, especially nowadays, within this whole, this whole perspective of multilingualism and, and interculturality, for example. That's uh, when we discuss trans language, 
For example, when I began studying ELF, we didn't talk about translingual practices, translanguage, even though it was there. Basically, we talked about, for example, uh, code mixing, uh, code switching, but translanguage studies, translingual uh, practices, so came, uh, let's say, in the last five years, especially with this dialogue with bilingual education with all the like Ophelia Garcia in Kanagaraja. So it entered ELF studies with a very strong, let's say, uh, uh, force. So then uh, the, the, I, I believe it is a phenomenon, it is the field of studies, and of course, with all the income tests, this is a scientific field of studies. So then, uh, uh, but probably we have people who will, as Eduardo said, who will investigate the phenomenon, but is not interested, uh, you know, in, it does, the person doesn't go to conferences, not interested in writing about this. So then I, I, I believe the, the, the field of studies is, is here, is producing, and the tendency is to expand. I don't know if, we, if this was basically what she meant, but then under the frame, we, uh, there is you know, all these dialogues with different areas. So, uh, and especially one thing that I think we need to more and more to put emphasis on is the pedagogical implications. So how do we bring all this to the classroom? How do we uh, establish a dialogue with ELT, for example? Right? Thank you, Savio and Eduardo. The next question is by Anderson Navelaico Marques. Why try to shrug any continuity or connection from what has been done before? Wouldn't that mean we are being true to ourselves and moving on from our own epistemophagy. Uh, I didn't. I didn't get the the last part. Well, I think let's say I mentioned not trying to move on. I uh, if I understand if I understood Anderson's question, when I mean uh, moving, uh, let's say the not. Of course, I'm. I, I didn't mean to disregard what came before. So the, let's say, any continuity connection. So yeah, yeah, Anderson. So I think I don't have an exact answer to that question at this moment, especially because I think once we are thinking of uh, an elf made in Brazil, especially, uh, I, I, I don't know at this point if, uh, you know, which path we're going to follow uh, when we consider, for example, what Clarissa said and what Anna said, right? So, of course, we, we don't, even if you want, we cannot simply abandon what came before, especially because I think, uh, depending on the situation, depending on the context, a lot of things are still under construction. So, there are, there are uh, scholars and even practitioners are still maybe, maybe even in phase one. So uh, we don't know, depending on the context. So they still, they're still maybe trying to teach ELF uh, through, uh, you know, forms and, uh, you know, considering more corporate data. So, you know, it's, I think this deserves more investigation, uh, I believe. I don't know if Eduardo agrees. No, I do. And not only do I agree, because I, I think one thing that's, that's important in what you said, Savi, too, is the way the area uh, uh, of ELF has evolved, uh, uh, it has been fast, right? I mean, from ELF uh -huh. 1 to ELF 2 to ELF 3, it has been fast. So that does mean that, you know, some people are still in phase 1, some people are still in phase 2, some people are moving on to phase 3. Uh, uh, Thinking about Anderson's question, I think it only highlights uh, even more what we said before, the idea that, you know, there is no clear answer to that. I think scholars, if we, if we do think, or if some of us do think that, you know, we need to take this direction of uh, uh, writing this up or, you know, suggesting uh, uh, an L4 or something different, I think that a lot of reflection still needs to be made so that this yeah. is not done without, you know, the necessary uh, reflection and the necessary uh, uh, discussion that uh, mm -hmm. 
you know that that should take place right uh, uh, in terms of right. and, and of whatever. course this does this doesn't mean struggling to be to what yes. came before no i'm sorry yes, if i, I made myself misunderstood no 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 I, I agree this doesn't mean shrugging at all yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i agree yeah. I, I agree i agree Okay, uh, Alison disappeared, so I'll jump in and okay. ask some more questions. Okay, <laughs> okay. Yeah, okay. Uh, I'll get some questions from the Q&A uh, tool. You too can also mm -hmm. uh, read the questions if you want. I'll go mm -hmm. to Paola Biel's questions, the first one, mm -hmm. and her question has to do with the proficiency exams. So right, she asked. Right. Although there is a growing concern with providing learners of English with different world accents while teaching the language, due to the widespread of English as a lingua franca, the same does not apply for proficiency exams. Do you think this can change? I, can I answer, yeah. Eduardo? Go ahead, sir. Go ahead. Go I, ahead. I, I, was gonna I, say I, I, I think it has to change. So, because uh, so otherwise, you know, I you will be interviewing people for artificial, there? you know, Hello? artificially. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Now I can. Now I can. Yeah. Now I can. Now I can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Hazan, can you hear me? Okay. So then I, going back, I think it has to change. So, and I, from what I know, from what I know, especially from my colleagues here in, in Salvador, the ones who are, uh, you know, Cambridge and even TOEFL, I, I don't know if TOEFL, but at least Cambridge and Michigan examiners. So they are not so radical in terms of accent, as long as the person can make himself or herself understood at the level that is expected, right? So exams are usually very formal. So then, uh, but I believe I'm going to concentrate here on accent. What she said about accent, I think it would be extremely, extremely unrealistic not to change because, for example, even if you go to London, to Cambridge, how many accents will you hear every day, right? So then I think it's something totally outdated in the absolutely anachronistic to, for example, evaluate someone, you know, be, uh, you know, based on the accent, as long as the person fulfills all the criteria established for a pass or fail. I mean, so I, I, I think it has to change. So that's my, if they don't, it means that they are not paying attention to what is happening to English around the world. Yeah, what I was what I was gonna say in relation to that is, uh, I think the, the I think this is a very important question uh, uh, because one thing that I think we we one area which we need to look at very specifically in regards to ELF is assessment, right? Assessment mm -hmm. is uh, so, I mean, and assessment not only in writing and in terms of acts, uh, sorry, not only speaking and in terms of uh, of accent, but in different ways too, right? I mean. What does it mean to assess somebody and, 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 and to assess somebody, sorry, uh, uh, taking this English as a lingua franca or uh, uh, awareness or, you know, uh, something in alignment with that, right? So the, the question is very important. There is a paper by Suresh Kanagaraja from 2006 where he addresses this and he addresses the fact that, you know, a lot of these tests like, is it Paola, her name? Uh, I think it's Paola, right? Yeah, okay. yeah, it's Paola, her name, right? Uh, uh, the question that Paola asked, uh, where he's saying, okay, does it make sense to still assess students, you know, based on uh, uh, norms uh, uh, that uh, work well or that are uh, from, you know, countries like the US or Britain, while these students might be doing different things? One thing mm -hmm. that I think he says in that paper that I think is really interesting, and we can still question that, but I think it was a very interesting first step or an advanced in that is he's, he tries to compromise a little. He says, look, for him, it may, and I agree with that, it makes sense if somebody's taken a test to live in, in the USA and study in an American university, the TOEFL perhaps makes sense. The problem is we're using the TOEFL for everything, right? We're using yeah. TOEFL and yeah. Cambridge exams. And 
for like every single situation. So that's not localizing at all. That's Even generalizing a test that has very specific aims in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what the test should do, which is, you know, is this student able to go to an America, to North American university in fall? So I think what Kanagaraja says in that paper, maybe he disagrees with himself today. I mean, it's been 14 years, but I think it's nice that he says, look, the TOEFL, he compromises a little. He says, look, the TOEFL makes sense for a student who wants to do that, who wants to study at an American university, Canadian university, et cetera. The problem is we're using TOEFL and Cambridge and these standardized assessments for everything. And it doesn't make sense, right? Uh, it doesn't make sense to do that. So I think the question is really important because we can start to think, how can we localize assessment? Because it's one, it's, there is one way of localizing assessment when we think about a specific classroom. But can we localize assessment in other contexts? I don't have an answer to that, but I think that is something that we need to uh, think more and more about, which is the, the mm -hmm. idea of mm -hmm. testing and assessment and, and so on. Yeah. I, I hope yeah. I answered the question. Yeah. I just I so would like to compliment uh, uh, Eduardo. I agree, of course, if uh, especially when it comes to formality, for example. But even so, even syntax, which is let's say more formal, let's put it this way. So there are so many variations nowadays. But for example, uh, go to an American uh, university's campus. How many Englishes will hear that? So then it is unrealistic to be demanding people. I'm concentrating on accent because her question was on accent, right? But of course, I totally agree with you. So uh, how many Englishes will we hear? I would say barely native speakers uh, accent, you see? So then uh, I think if they want to continue uh, assessing people, you know, based on what real English or the real world is, so they need to change. And I, I believe there have been some changes. So I, do I don't know to what changes. extent. Right. I do think there have been changes too in attitudes. Like you said, Xavi, and, and I've heard this from examiners too, some yeah. examiners' attitudes towards certain forms and towards certain ways of using English yes. have yes. changed, right? And I think that is a... a, a, a uh, one step in the right direction, but I agree that there are many others that have to be taken. Yeah, sure, uh, sure. Right. sure. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, but I cannot go on with the Q&A because <laughs> when my internet connection failed, I was logged off the session. So the Q&A appears empty for me. I have one last question from YouTube, if I can ask it now and then Hosani can go on with the Q&A, okay? Okay. Um, the last question that I collected on the YouTube chat was also from Professor Clarissa and she asked Eduardo to talk about locality as identity. That was it. Mm -hmm. Oh, just to me, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, locality as identity. I think uh, uh, if I understood her question well, I think, and I think we, we addressed uh, a little bit of this in the begin at the beginning of the presentation. And forgive me if, I'm, uh, if I didn't understand the question well, Clarissa, but the way I think is we usually attach identities uh, or there, in traditional ways of thinking about identity, we think of identity as attached to a specific place into a specific territory. So. You're from the northeast of Brazil, like I am and like Savio is, then you speak a certain way, you, you work in a certain way, you, you, you talk in a certain way, you eat certain foods. I think one thing that we need to start doing is uh, deconstructing that, right? This idea that, you know, identities are necessarily tied to territory. Uh, are they tied to territory? Sure, in, in some ways they are, right? But they're not necessarily tied to territory and that tie doesn't mean any monolithic uh, construction of these identities, right? Or any homogeneous uh, construction of, of these identities, right? So that is uh, one way of, of me uh, thinking this question. Another way for me to think this question is the idea that we are local in many different places, right? I mean, uh, I live in Curitiba, but I'm, I'm, I'm local here, of course, but I'm local in many different classes, uh, in many different contexts here and outside of here as well. So I think that uh, uh, 
identity and locality uh, it does have to do with you know the 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 locality from where i speak so you know the body position that i have you know a male person from the northeast uh, uh you know who who is a certain age and who has a certain status in society so locality not only as location right uh uh, uh and identity detached from the idea of location, right? So two things, uh, uh, just to make myself clearer, perhaps, or maybe less clear. <laughs> but uh, one is, if you think of location first, territory, detach this idea that identity is necessarily tied to territory, right? Or that it is determined by territory. But thinking of locality in, different, in, a, in a broader sense, locality in the sense that, you know, it's the body position that I have and who I am and where I'm from and the histories that constitute me that make me speak from a certain position, right? Again, as a male professor of English who has lived in different places, okay? You know, a, a locality, all of these things being part of who I am, then I think, uh, uh, in a way, not, not necessarily detaching that from, from uh, uh, identity, but understanding that this is part of identity, but not creating a deterministic relationship between the two. Uh, I don't know if I answered the question, but at least that's uh, uh, what I would think about that. Well, if I can add a little bit, for example, the, I think, as we know, identity is a construct that is always changing. So it's never monolithic. And I think, for example, when we, when we, uh, emphasize and then we work let's say with locality i think it helps these these identities to be uh in a way they they are uh made more visible and also deconstructed reconstructed in the sense that uh, uh it is from locality we can expand this to a broader let's say to broader context, and this implies, for example, uh, different different uh, uh, resources, different, uh, let's say, even you know emotions, the affective, uh, uh, the affective elements. So then I think uh, working with locality in many ways triggers, uh, uh, from a practical point of view. It triggers in, in, in our students or in ourselves the identity constructs that we have in order to, to you know, deconstruct it, to uh, move on, uh, to renew it, to expand. It. So then it's just like maybe, a, 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 let's say, a, 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 a starting point for us to, to, you know, to discuss the, this complex uh, concept, which is identity. So maybe that's, that's one way of looking at that. So. Thanks, okay. <laughs> so uh, I guess uh, Alison is out of questions, but uh, there are many more here. I'll, I think well, I'll read two more <laughs> and then we finish, is that okay? There is one by Jeanne Ellen. She's a doctoral student here at PPGE. And she writes, acknowledging the three different phases of ELF, how should we look at studies that position themselves more in phase one or phase two? Should we consider that the third phases, the three phases are happening together? And is it okay? Or should we understand that things evolved and studies in the first phases are outdated? This is a good question. And uh, uh, it's an excellent ex uh, question, Johnny, and uh, it deserves uh, investigation. So I, I really cannot say uh, for sure in which phase we are, depending on the context. For example, uh, when, when Jenkins, five years ago, she elaborated this, this whole reflection on, on ELF-3, for example, on the phases, she was beginning to, uh, you know, predict, let's put it this way, what, uh, what 
let's say what step, what which which how we could further the studies on health. But it doesn't mean so that's that was a theorization. It doesn't mean, and I don't think we have enough studies to say uh, in which phase we are now. For example, if you think of uh, in, in, in my in my context. Uh, as a teacher educator, maybe we have gone through phase two, uh, getting into phase three slowly. But I, I, uh, I'm sure, as we said before, that depending on the context, depending on the, 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 the situation, so you might still have people maybe in phase two. So, or so then it's it's hard to say without investigating because it's it's you know when you think of uh, context, it's so complex. So basically, it's, it was interesting to uh, when she elaborated the three different phases and she proposed an evolution. Let's put it this way, but it's hard to guarantee uh, where else studies as a whole uh, are now. I think it, it depends a lot on, on context. So I, I really, uh, I would say, we've been talking a lot about translanguaging, and, but I, I'm sh I cannot say, for example, that our ELT classes in different contexts, schools, language institutes, university, we have, uh, we've been having translingual practices you know, they are welcome as we, we believe they, they could be. So then um, I don't think there is a right answer for that without investigation, broad investigation. Edward. Yeah, to me, I think that just highlights how, how you know, any area of study is diffuse and, you know, how uh, heterogeneous and how, I mean, we do try to find unity in some uh, uh, ways but it just, to me, it just highlights very strongly how, you know, and to me, one thing about ELF specifically, and I, I want to say that again, I have already said that, but I want to repeat it, is that it has evolved, you know, the, the phases that Jenkins talks about in that 2015 paper, there, I mean, and I agree with Saiba that she's proposing a third phase. She's not necessarily saying that there is a third phase in place, but it, it took place fast. So it's easier for you to see, you know, even more uh, uh, um, diffusion, I don't know if diffusion is the word, but even more, you know, heterogeneity within uh, 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 the studies, you know, if people still doing studies within ELF 1, people still looking at ELF from within ELF 2, people trying to advance, you know, uh, uh, ELF studies through uh, uh, ELF 3. But I, I, I don't think, although this happened fast, and I think this is not unique to ELF, but, you know, this is certainly something to consider, you know, this heterogeneity is not unique to ELF as an area of study. I think heterogeneity exists in fields of study. I mean, if you, mm -hmm. if you ask people what communicative approach is, you know, I think all five of us here who are in this conversation are going to say something very different and uh, uh, from whether we have worked with it or not worked with it. And this happens in, in uh, uh, several different, not only with, in several different areas of study, but even uh, uh, in regards to several concepts that seem to be consolidated, but you know, many times they're not as consolidated as one yeah. might think, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think we we should finish, but I'll just there are two quick questions I think that you could answer, and we have some more questions on the chat, but then that's just too much I think. But I can send you the questions if you want later and. Uh, Maybe address them uh, okay. directly to the person who asked. All right. right? Yes, please. Okay. Uh -huh. So this uh, there is one question by Salvia de Medeiro Souza, but I think her question will be addressed in our session number five, because she's uh -huh. asking about how does ELF connect to interculturality and internationalization in higher education. And we are going to have a whole session on that topic. So maybe I'll save that one for the speakers of that uh, session, right? There is a more specific question here okay. by Stephanie. Good. Do you want to address it or do you agree? This one. Which one? 
This one about interculturality, internationalization. Do you want to address it, or can we? Which one is that? How can? How can? How can the how perspective does, of health? Uh, no, how does how ELF the, connect to interculturality and how does internationalization? Inter yeah, in higher education. I think the question is more about internationalization. That's mm -hmm. why I think Hosani is suggesting that it be addressed. Uh, yeah. Uh, Session five, which is about the topic. Yeah. By the future. Uh, if, yeah. if I could say one thing about it, okay. just one very quick thing about it is mm -hmm. every time I say that I work with, you know, English as an international language, English as a lingua franca, a lot of times people already associate that with internationalization of higher yeah. education. A lot of people already tie me to, okay, so, you know, internationalization initiatives that are taking place at the university, you should be looking into that. I don't think there is necessarily a tie between the two things. I think ELF and EIL and related studies can inform internationalization practices and the way they happen, but the natural tie that people make, it, it, uh, uh, it's something that puzzles me a little bit. I was, I'm yeah. just going to say that you know, and leave the question to that. Uh, it depends on, on what, I mean, what, uh, let's say, what, uh, view of internationalization you have because for example you can you can work on uh, internationalization from different uh, or different let's say uh, from a linguistic point of view for example internationalization means that we have equipped you know professors students with language language skills in order to either send people abroad or receive uh, uh, you know uh, visitors etc etc uh, to to teach and to interact so then i think as eduardo said elf studies can illuminate uh the whole let's say when it comes to the linguistic area uh in order to to let's say be flexible enough not to be uh because for example our experience with internationalization here implies a lot of English, and then people always say, well, in order to become international, we, we need to learn English, and the, the, the problem is not what, but how we, are we going to implement these policies related to, to, to uh, using the language or the languages, because internationalization does not imply only English. So then I think ELF studies can, in a way, uh, help the, the ones involved with the linguistic area uh, when it comes to internationaliz internationalization in higher education. So, because uh, I think there, there's still a lot of tradition going on there, so. Okay. Uh, Eduardo, it's a specific question because I think the first example that you showed of a um, page from a PNLD book a textbook, and the person is Stephanie Moreira Toledo. She's asking, what uh, edition are, we, are you talking about? I think it's Savius. Savius is the one. Ah, okay. Oh, okay. Okay. I think <laughs> okay. The first edition of a book, I don't know if I should mention the title, but it's the first edition of a book that was approved, if I'm not mistaken, for the Penial Day of like, 2017 or 2015, I'm not sure. But I think there is a second edition of this book already, and uh, I'm not sure, it was published by Macmillan, uh, but I'm not sure if they kept the same, uh, the same um, activity. But I know that the book was from one of the editions or either 2015 or 2017. Okay. And I, I don't the, think I should cite the book here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, the last question then, and then I have, well, I don't know if Alison wants to do, we have a few uh, messages to give to the, the audience. Mm -hmm. But uh, the last question also by Stephanie Toledo, how can the perspective of ELF reach in-service teachers so they get to know about it, considering that such curriculum seems to be still recent. How okay, can the perspective reach in service students so that they can get to know about it, consider such curriculum? I don't know what she's calling the curriculum here, mm -hmm. uh, 
but the I think how how can the perspective of health reach in service teachers? I think this is one of the initiatives. So uh, I think first of all, ongoing teacher education. So uh, curricula uh, like the ones for the one uh, uh, Eduardo shared here with us um, in applied linguistics. Uh, more and more, uh, let's say, uh, teachers involved or interested in, in, in the topic. And uh, the, the, I, I think more, it's, it's the, whatever we have, you know, basically at university, we have this, 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 the role of doing that. And of course, promoting as many events as possible locally, especially locally, in order to discuss uh, uh, the topic. So it's bringing up the topic in, in, in teacher training, edu uh, teacher training courses, in uh, extension programs, uh, and of course, uh, uh, in disciplines like the one uh, the ones that uh, Eduardo shared with us. For example, here. Basically, we do that um, through different, uh, let's say, activities, especially teacher training and uh, uh, extension courses related to health. And the, the you know, in our, in our course, we don't have this beautiful curriculum that you, the curriculum that you showed us with so many dis disciplines where it's possible to discuss health but we do have, uh, uh, you know, a discipline that tackle health. But anyway, it's make it more visible through different uh, uh, promoting events, promoting uh, activities like this, uh, in, in the making, letting letting the 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 the, the, the concept travel. That's the, the the idea. I think Eduardo can complement. Yeah, yeah I want to Stephanie. Stephanie just added that she was referring to the curriculum you showed. I guess it's to Eduardo, really, right? Ah, okay. Okay, okay, okay. okay, okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. I guess that uh, in terms of the curriculum I showed, I mean, it's so new. It's, it's brand new, right? I mean, we have just started, and Alison can speak to that too, right? Because he, he arrived, we were just passing it. Uh, so I think that uh, the curriculum we developed is a curriculum for pre-service teachers. We weren't thinking of in-service teachers at that time, but bringing the same type of knowledge and the same type of discussions to in-service teachers through events and through, uh, 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 you know, closer contacts with these teachers in their, in their uh, uh, local context, I think is one way of addressing uh, Stephanie's question. Uh, Stephanie's question. One thing that I think is really important too, and I think we, we need to highlight is we're talking a lot about this idea of us going to, to in-service teachers and the curriculum and, and so on. But I think it's also important for us to hear what uh, uh, in-service teachers, what teachers have to say to us, not necessarily about ELF, but about their local context, their local practices. And once they become more and more familiarized with ELF, with what they've been doing, what they can do, I think it's important that this connection we have with teachers be, you know, work both ways, right? So it's us you know, uh, uh, bringing some uh, uh, us presenting things that we think are going to be useful to them, but also hearing from them, you know, what they have to say to us because they have, uh, uh, they have uh, uh, very, uh, um, I want to say a very strong word that I can't find right, but they have wonderful experiences and practical experiences that they can bring to us and that we need to listen to, uh, uh, which can help us even advance, you know, thinking about these uh, uh, implications in different contexts, right? Okay, uh, I think I'll let uh, Alison say the thank you part and close the session, but I just want to mention two, three things. <laughs> The first one is that certificates, because many people always ask about that, and I answered already in the chat, certificates are available for those who registered and attended the event. Zoom captures the, 
names of people who were here and so we know who was here and you can also see from the YouTube chat. But we need addresses, we need an email. So if you haven't registered, we cannot send the certificates, right? So generally it takes from one to two weeks for the certificates to be ready. So just be patient, they will arrive, okay? The second thing is that many people ask you to, to share the slides. So if you want us to share the slides and if you forward the slides to us, we can forward the slides to the, the audience. And the third thing is that we're gonna have the third session on August 11th. And it's a follow up from this one, right? Because we're gonna be talking about, about conceptions of language and uh, language teachers practice. So it's with Adriana Delagnello and Ana Paula Beato Canato. So we hope to see you all here and thank you. And now Alison take over, please. Thank you too. <laughs> thank you, Rosani, for the help with the Q&A. Unfortunately, I was logged off, so I was not able to continue with the questions. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank Savio and Eduardo for conducting this beautiful session. I think it was an amazing session, very provocative and informative, and I think it helped everyone uh, in the audience to understand and reflect more this new concept of English as a lingua franca, as you mentioned. So thank you both. Uh, I'm sorry about the noises. Are you, can you hear them? Yes, yes. Okay, but I'll continue because, you know, I'm at my house, so we must get used to the things, right? Okay. Uh, I'd like to thank the audience, everyone who sent questions and comments and participated, especially my friends from UFPR, who have been very welcoming and very lovely in the sense to come here and participate and be part of this. So thank you very much. Um, maybe Eduardo and Savio, you can give us some closing statements and then I'll just say our goodbyes. Okay, go, uh, you go, go ahead, Eduardo. Okay, okay. I want to finish uh, reiterating what I said at the beginning, that it was an honor to be here, that I'm First. very happy. I'm so happy about the invitation. Uh, uh, I want to thank you, Alison, and you, Rosani, for uh, uh, organizing this event, this ongoing event, which I think has been so beautiful so far. And I want to thank the two institutions, say that the two institutions, like I said before, are part of my life and you know live deeply within my heart. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm very happy. I want to uh, I want to thank Savio again too for this dialogue and this the way we constructed everything and the way we built everything and for always you know since I met Savio and I don't know if he remembers this but I met him at an Elf conference <laughs> yes. right a few years ago right uh, since I met him he's always been so generous and so uh, uh, inspiring in many ways. So thank you Savio very much. No, and I want you. to thank the audience very much. Uh, I'm very sorry that I couldn't say hello to everyone. I saw hellos in the beginning, uh, but we were testing things. So, you know, I want to give a shout out and a hi to everyone who was there, you know, our colleagues here at UFPA and students, also uh, friends that I have at UFSKI, you know, Doneska, uh, uh, who is a professor there, and Hosani, who's here, I know, but, you know, who was my professor there when I was at Ufsky, right? And other people, if I didn't see your name during the chat, I'm sorry, but uh, I just wanna say hi to all of you uh, and thank you for being with us, right? Sorry that the presentation took longer than we thought, Alison, but I, I think it worked, right? <laughs> and I hope it did work, right? <laughs> yeah, well, I, I also, uh, well, Eduardo has said many things that I would say, but first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Alison and Rosani, uh, congratulations on, on, on the organization of such a great event. It's a way for us to be together, although we are uh, apart, you know, uh, because of this moment. But uh, I also have deep appreciation for uh, colleagues in, 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 at, at FPR, like Clarissa and Eduardo and many others, and of course, uh, uh, Ufski. So, Rosani, and uh, uh, it's, it's always been a pleasure to be uh, at these two, uh, let's say, uh, places that are basically, we are partners, right, from the same system. So, thank you very much for inviting me. So, 
thanks the audience for for the wonderful uh, you know provoking questions. I don't know. It, it it's very difficult for us to be here behind you know in front of the cameras and then uh, think of so many so many things that don't come to mind immediately. So then uh, only the ones who are here know how difficult it is to address so many so many uh, questions and issues at the same time. So sorry if we didn't address everything that was posed here, but we made an effort to share, uh, you know, with you these uh, uh, things that we believe in and then things that we want, we would like, especially our fellow teachers to be aware of. So then, uh, sorry, Alice, when in, in the, Ozani, if the presentation was, you know, made differently, but then uh, Eduard and I uh, discussed this and we wanted to do it together because we, we, we belong in the same group. We think very, in very similar ways. Of course, we have uh, differences, but then I think it worked out. So I'm very happy and uh, thanks. And I hope, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the audience had fun and uh, see you next time sometime. Thank you very much. Um abraço da Bahia para vocês. Abraço de Curitiba para todo mundo também. <laughs> Thank you, Savio. Thank you, Eduardo. Thank you, the audience, once again. I will be back as a moder moderator in our next session, August 11th, with Professor Ana Paulo Beato Canato from UFR and Professor Adriana Delanil from UFSC to discuss uh, language conceptions and how this influences teachers' practice, okay? So this talk will stay available on YouTube. If you missed it, you'll be able to watch it um, again anytime. Just access YouTube and it will be there. So thank you very much again. Please stay safe and I hope to see you again in two weeks, okay? Thank you. Bye-bye. Logging off now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eduardo, for being great thank partner. Star. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I say the same. <laughs> thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.